Welcome back to Batuta Talks with myself, Clancy Overall, editor of the Batuta Advocate, and Errol Parker, editor at large. And uh, a lot going on in the news cycle. Most recently, the 2024 Oscar Awards, which are always a bit of fun. Yes, it was a great distraction from all the other news that's been going on around the world at the moment. Absolutely. That's what Hollywood would exist for, right? Like a little bit of razzle dazzle. Nothing like a bit of razzle dazzle. Sea of glumness. Yeah. Today's guest is the encyclopedia of Razzle Dazzle. Uh, <laughs> he's the I one that can that. talk to you about anything ever that's ever occurred on film. Uh, movies, TV series, uh, anything that you know of that's appeared as some... You're mostly feature lengths. I right? love the feature length film. Yeah, yeah. I love the feature length. Now, Alexi... Toliopoulos, as I said, the Rain Man, the Encyclopedia of Razzle Dazzle, um, cinephile. They call him the the Greek Tarantino. He has a new podcast, uh, which is broadcast out of this town. It's called The Last Video Store. Last Video Store Batuta. Last Video Store Batuta, Queensland. We're obviously the town that hosts the Last Video Store. And uh, I'm going to let you, Alexi, explain the format of your program which I appeared on this week, actually, as a, as, a, as a guest and a customer of the last video store. You were our last customer to walk through those doors and to pick up a rental combo. But I'll say this, like, this is pretty much my dream film podcast. I've always wanted to have a show like this because I think it's, like, my mission on this planet to connect people to the films they love. Yep. And what better way to do it than jumping back into my old stomping crown or the video store, having chats with interesting people like yourself – and talking about the movies they love, but in the style of that old school rental combo that you'd pick up on a Friday night, go into the video store back in those golden days, you know, yeah. those hazy, nostalgic times. And so people will be coming in talking about a new release film that they love, two weeklies, which are just old movies that they'll love for the rest of their lives. And then I'm going to take it upon me. My duty is to recommend them a staff pick based on their tastes. So taking those things, taking the conversation that we have, using my God-given ability of empathizing with other people through movies and finding something that I think they'll love for the rest of their life to just kind of like, I really want to inspire people to discover films and wanting to explore further than they have before. Now, this uh, podcast is available anywhere you get your podcast, but it's also on YouTube, which mm-hmm. is a, a new uh, and exciting development for DM Podcasts and the town of Batuta in general at large. And for me as well. And for you. Yeah. And but can I just say, you pop on screen. Oh, my God. The camera loves me. Mm. I hope I get discovered and become a movie star myself. Well. I appear on one yeah. of the DVDs on our many infinite walls. Well, those uh, those the, those cameras that we film it on, they're uh, black magic cameras, <laughs> uh, which are which are Australian made, believe it or not. They're made down in Melbourne. Wow. Um, so yeah, as the person around here whose name is on the credit card, <laughs> I I know these things. Wow, you went all out those black magics, you know. We are uh, construing things beyond mysticism yep. in there. Alexi, you yeah. a, as a as a previous guest in mm-hmm. Batuta's last video store. As uh, the most recent guest, you gave me a staff pick, which I have not been able to locate. Mm-hmm. I won't say what it is, but this that should go to show the listeners just uh, how vast your knowledge is that you have suggested a film which seems to triangulate my three films that I'd mentioned. Yeah, and you, they were disparate. Your choices were all over the place. Yeah, they were all over the place. You uh, sent me a huge challenge, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you gave me a film that looks, from what I can read, to you know, tickle all three of those films, but it is just not available in Australia. I'm going to have to re- you know resort to piracy or something like that to yeah, watch well, it. Yeah, well, you can come into the last video store, rent it out from here. Yeah, then. yeah. Well, yeah, I should. <laughs> in I the should. fantasy it's, realm, that is. To my uh, my late fees, uh, <laughs> very very close to one thousand dollars. And um, the last guy that owned that store before you and me had an arrangement. So, um, uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure we could cook something up. Let's cook something up. Now, but that that is that, that should show the listeners just how vast this is. That he can name a, I'm going to say a Nordic Nordic film mm-hmm. uh, made 20 years ago uh, that's not available in Australia. This man has seen it because he's seen everything and he knows everything. 
How did you see it? How do you? How would you have seen a Nordic film that you can't get in this country from 20 years ago? Well, I'll say this. I have my ways. I have my ways because I'm like very looped into importing films yeah. like through legal means and some more nefarious means. But the thing that I care about most is like being able to find things. And it's kind of been my mission for most of my life is yeah. to build up, as you put it, like an encyclopedic knowledge of films. And I have like a veracity, a hunger that is unending yeah. for discovery, for finding films out there in the world. And uh, this film I'd heard about for a long time in particular. It's from a well-known Nordic filmmaker yeah. that's made the cross to Hollywood and made some big cult films yeah. and is making some weird and interesting stuff. And it was just like the film of his that I had not seen. I'd yeah. seen a lot of like his uh, Danish films as well. Yeah. And, but this was the one that had been a bit harder to find. So it's been on my list personally for a long time. And then when I kind of was getting the vibe of what you were picking, it became time for me to seek this film out. I knew that it had to be the one because it just made so much sense because, you know, you picked a slacker comedy, yeah. you picked a heinous, dirty crime film, and then a really a film that had like a really lovely, detailed sense of space. Yeah. And I thought this film in particular would lean into that. And so far, I think all the guests on the podcast – I've had pretty good track record of like yeah. finding them like oddities or things that they've not heard of or things that they've yet to watch, but really lands into their taste. And I yeah. think that's something that I like have always had a lot of pride in and something I've really wanted to like capture again is just like being able to connect people to movies. Yeah. You know, he says things, this man will say things like, oh yeah, that's a great film. I've got it on Blu-ray. I'll bring mm. it in for you. I'm like, Alexi, I don't know. Like, unless someone's rocking a PS5 or something at home. I mean, PS5 probably doesn't even play Blu-ray anymore. It does. It does? And if, yeah. if it's got a disc tray, it'll play it. PS4 does too. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I, but I'm at that point where I might just, like, keep a, like, keep that thing on me. Keep a Blu-ray player oh, you got on it. my back and just going, here, let me give you the disc keep, and the means to play as well. Keep that thing on me. <laughs> Keeping a multi-region Blu-ray player in my backpack at all times. Yeah. So um, have you got, like... A, a movie watching routine. I mean, it, mm. it is essentially your job now. So I guess you can you can find time that you can carve out to consume these things. I yeah. Mean, I just. I mean, I I would like to watch more flicks, but I I just cannot find the time. I think it's like for me because it is the thing that I love most. I've always been able to find that time. And I probably try to watch a movie every day. But there'll be some days where I just don't get the time. So I'll watch like four on the weekend, five on the weekend, maybe more than that. Because it's just the thing I love most. Like I'll wake up early in the day and go, well, I'm going to chuck a movie on. Or I'll stay up late at night and go, well, what do I want to do? I want to watch a movie I've never seen before. When Let's go to that. When do you start shaming yourself? Like what's the latest you'll put a film on? Oh, dude, I've done it yeah. like midnight and stuff. <laughs> like I, I tell you, one of the best viewing, like exciting experiences I've ever had. There is this movie uh, called Set It Off, which is an F. Gary Gray heist film starring Vivica Fox, Queen Latifah, Jada Pinkett Smith, actors I really, really love. And it had been kind of weirdly hard to see for most of my life. Like it, I could have seen it on DVD, but I missed my chance. And then one this night- is like almost Tupac, Jada Pinkett Smith era. Yeah, just yeah. after, like yeah. uh, 1990, mid-90s. Yeah. And um, like in that primo like heist film era, yeah. like just before Ocean's Eleven, yeah. but just after Heat, yeah. where people are just like, oh, heist movies, you yeah. can do interesting things there. And I had always wanted to see it. I'd been aware of it because I kind of like that era of film. I really love like that era, especially of, like African-American cinema. Mm -hmm. So I've always loved F. Gary Gray, weirdly. He's yeah. just been a director I've loved for my whole life. Mm. Impossible to find for ages. One night, just before bed, midnight, I'm scrolling on Netflix and it comes up. I'm like, oh my God. So I chucked it on and I was like, I just wanted enough to like wet my beak. Just go, let's have a taste before bed. Could not stop. I watched the whole thing. It's like two hours long. Like it's a long movie. It's not short. And I just like zoned in and watched it. And then I could not fall asleep because I stayed up reading about the film for the next like hour. So I didn't get to bed till maybe 4 a.m. Because I just wanted to like just luxuriate in this movie. So that's a shame. But it was also like true unctuous pleasure for me watching a film discovering it and I'll probably say this as well like 
when it's the thing that you love, you find the balance shifts to it. Like I don't watch like any TV shows almost. I watch maybe five yeah. shows a year and a lot of those are the shows that I watch every year like Drag Race or like Top Chef or whatever and those are the films I can actually zone out to and just yeah. enjoy doesn't feel like a scholarly pursuit to me like you know I didn't even watch you guys TV show until like until I was like well I think I have to until I, I, to yes. to. yeah. I moved to Batuta well, I was know. like I gotta fit in and I love it as well no, not everyone's got Paramount I'll tell you what on Boxing Day in 2001 I actually uh I went to the midnight screening of First Lord of the Rings movie. Oh, wow. I um, dressed up as a hobbit. <laughs> and, uh, Did you really? And what do you, what, okay, I'm imagining you've got the cloak, you've got a little vest on of some kind. I, yeah, what no, about the feet? What are you packing on the feet? I went in, um, well, I was, I was not as old as I am then, so I went in a <laughs> pair of jelly sandals that were, um, that was see through. That wow. Did that's, you pop like a little merkin on top? Give those a little hairy hobbit feet? That's a bookish young man right there. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that. No, it's, uh, yeah, no, it was good. It was uh, very past my bedtime. I, I, I think we got home at about, you know, a quarter to six in the morning. <laughs> Was uh yeah no it's that's very, a true pilgrimage very patient mother very wow. very was, long film uh, especially my mother at the time where you know the, the deepest fiction that she would mm. consume was an episode of murder she wrote wow. on on a Saturday morning the Angela Lansbury uh, classic after tennis <laughs> <laughs> but she went all in I mean mothers like sacrifice so much for the little nerdy sons what my was the mom? the rule with you your mother gave you the rule with um. The Godfather. Oh, okay. My mum, too, because I really, I was a young cinephile and I was like, I want to get into films deep. And I remember like going, well, everything's about The Godfather. Everyone talks about The Godfather being the greatest movie. And I was kind of interested in crime films and like crime and mafia type shit. It's like, well, I have to watch this. My, there was R18 and I was probably 13 years old. And my mum was like, well, you can't watch this unless you read the book first. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to read the book. It's like this huge, fat novel. Pulp. It's pulpy <laughs> as well. And the book was far less appropriate for a child <laughs> to be reading. And I remember like having the book, and it's like page 17. You see Sonny Corleone in vigorous detail boning out one of the... Uh, bridesmaids. The bridesmaids at the wedding. Which is a one second scene in, in yeah. the film. But one in this second cut away. Like she he jerks into her in yeah. pure ecstasy. I, let me tell you, the words <laughs> elongated pole pulsing are used in that passage. <laughs> and I was like 13. So I taking the book to school going, bros, you will not believe what they're allowed yeah. to write in books. You reckon I've never having, seen it in writing before. You reckon you've seen some sex in Tomorrow When the War Began? Yeah. You should read this <laughs> shit. you got no idea. They're using words like sticky, disgusting. Yeah. And like the book is so strange compared to the movie because it's like all that. She becomes a main character that bridesmaid yeah. <laughs> and it's like a whole plot line about how I'm not I, this is true let, if you think I'm about to say something insane I am and let it be known it is true in the book The Godfather that character that appears in the film for maybe two scenes uh, and she becomes a more important character in the third film yes but there is a whole subplot that follows her journey because she has a rather wide uh, vaginal passage yep the probably the most disgusting way I could have said that. <laughs> uh, and Sonny was the only person with a hog big enough to pleasure her. Yeah. And then he, Santino. Santino dies, so she must go on a journey uh, of uh, marrying this doctor who can then perform surgery on her. And fix, fix well, not fix, but to... Um, to shrink? Shrink her... Her passage? Her passage, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I actually think the Godfather book, and we're getting right off topic here to what the, mm. the point of this episode is, but... Um, this is what it is. This is the the joy of film, right? Yeah. You end up talking about the books. You end up talking about, you know, bestsellers. You end up talking about Oscar winners. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think in that Godfather book, they could have made two to three spin off films. Mm. I reckon following Johnny Fontaine through L.A. Yeah, post wedding. Yeah, would be crazy. You know, yeah. he's over there with his and and because then, then that way the call the only family only exists in phone calls really. Mm culminating with a residency in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a good idea. Yeah. We, we yeah. should make that movie. Yeah. Well, did you know that the uh, the author of The Godfather, Mario Puzo, wrote the screenplay. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. And uh, after the success of the, the Godfather, 
he got he got asked to write a, a, a few more mm-hmm. so he, he he was like i've got no idea what i'm doing yeah. i knew how to write my story mm. i'll go and get a screenwriting book that'll teach me how to write a proper bona fide sc- screenplay goes and buys this book opens it up <laughs> on the first page it says watch the godfather <laughs> Uh, oh, it's so yeah, good. I think that was when He's he was. No help to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was also when he was like writing the screenplay for Superman, like the seventies one. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like man, it's it's so wild. <laughs> so much it's cocaine like, uh, involved in some of those old yeah. blokes. Oh reckon. yeah, they've I mean, flown too close to the sun. Yeah, that was line. lesson two in the book. So yeah. watch the Godfather, and yeah, and snort a little something interesting. Yeah. Well, even Scorsese, I know he wasn't involved in the Godfather's, but he admits to. Abusing cocaine, Goodfellas might have no. been when, when it's appearing on screen <laughs> yeah. like that. It's like Scorsese's obviously doing something similar behind Scorsese's cokiest film. I reckon is the Last Waltz. Oh that yeah, that he did with all those musicians. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is good grief. In the new 4K <laughs> restoration of it, you can actually finally see the glob of cocaine in Neil Young's on nose. Neil Young's nose. I've always heard about it, never been able to see it. The 4K resto. Pristine crystals you're seeing right there. <laughs> Gorgeous stuff. God, I gotta watch that one. Yeah, you would love it, man. Especially mm. if you love Boomer style music. Mm. It's the oh, best yeah. film ever. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, we want to talk about the Oscars because mm-hmm. um I feel like you're the only authority that I would be willing to listen to on the twenty twenty four Oscar Awards. Mm-hmm. Who do you think were the winners and who were the losers? In the sense that who deserved to win? And who won? Yeah. And who deserved to win and who lost? Well, I think this was a really good year. I'll say yeah. that. Like, 2023, the year that was celebrated the 96th Academy Awards, mm-hmm. I think was genuinely a fantastic year for film, especially, yeah. like, you know, that post-COVID yeah. world. Like, the movies are actually happening. They were coming out. They were being released. But they had been made as well. Like, 2019, I thought, was a historically great year. 2023, not too far behind it. Um, And I think the Oscars, through their nominations, genuinely recognize that. So I think the big winner is audiences and cinema. And I'm going to say that completely sincerely and genuinely. The audiences were the winners this Mm -hmm. year. And I thought the actual ceremony was fantastic. Like, it was really fun. Obviously, the big winner was Oppenheimer, winning Best Picture and I think six other awards in most of the major categories. And it's really hard to argue against that because Mm. it celebrates something that the Oscars often celebrate, which is biographical films, Mm -hmm. but also, like, big, tremendous... Uh, achievements or things that push the needle forward. And Christopher Nolan is a really celebrated filmmaker. He's done a lot for cinema and the cinema going experience, like completely revitalized it. In the history of the Oscars, they even updated the best picture category from five to 10 because the Dark Knight did not make it into that top five. And they were like, well, how do we change that? How do we give more space for blockbuster entertainment and films that maybe mean more to audiences Mm -hmm. than to like the filmmaking community or critical community the academy to the academy itself how do we broaden that out so they Mm -hmm. that was like a contribution of him it's good that blockbuster directors could be seen can be seen but also like it is a pretty wild film to have made nearly a billion dollars worldwide mm. like for it to be what's this one Oppenheimer Oppenheimer yeah, yeah, yeah. for it to yeah. be a biographical film about a billion American dollars yeah. a billion yeah. USD brother yeah. a billion USD greenback <laughs> <laughs> a million dead presidents lined up man that's it a million dead presidents put into Oppenheimer it's all about the Benjamins it's baby it's all about those Benjis brother <laughs> um, so it's like Oppenheimer it's like also a big artistic achievement because I think it takes a lot of like his storytelling that he's been working on in like shifting temporal spaces telling stories out of time in ways that can kind of be meaningful connections like i'm pretty agnostic when it comes to christopher nolan i love a lot of his films i don't love all of them oppenheimer was one that i found to be uh, a complete synthesization of all the things that he's done yeah so i found it's incredibly difficult to argue against that film being the film of the year but i think the 10 that were nominated i thought it was a spectacular film yeah and i'm so glad i saw it in the cinema the fact that he can just the, the sheer ability to fit that much information mm-hmm. in was what i found crazy i also thought uh old mate murphy 
uh, Killian Murphy was due a role mm. like that, like a big leading yeah. role, especially yeah. in you know he's collaborated with Nolan quite a few yeah. times to give him that ascendance to like also a great character. And yeah. I think that performance is fantastic because it has you know those biographical notes that are big ticks at the yeah. Oscars, but. He's also like playing in nuance. It's yeah. not really a huge outwardly expressionistic performance. Mm. But I, I think it's hard to argue with like those 10. Like there's other films I love from that year, but American Fiction, Anatomy, Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, mm. Past Lives, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. Like that is a really stellar lineup. And especially seeing smaller films like The Zone of Interest and past lives both sneak into that top 10. Yeah. Like those are kind of movies that maybe get ignored, yeah. but when they expand it to a 10 and there's a room, great year. These films had buzz. They would have built their way into it. I found that, I think that's really exciting and things that should mm. be uh, really celebrated. And I'd even say as far as that goes, Anatomy of a Fall, uh, Justin Trier, that is such an exciting nomination that she gets into Best Picture and Best Director nominations so, as well. So someone like her, she, she now- won though for Best Adapted Screenplay, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, or oh, Best Original Screenplay. Best Original best Screenplay. Original screenplay. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she gets to win, and, and, and rightly so, and deservedly. Mm. But we look at these Hollywood, I guess the blockbusters, or I'm talking about the blockbusters here, they haven't changed for 20 years. These mm. guys can work forever. And we look at the Scorseses and the Nolans and the Camerons and the Ridley Scotts, mm. They, they haven't, like, as in the top brass hasn't changed for 20 mm. years. Has anyone joined the ranks? Well, I think definitely this year we saw, like, True Ascendance, Greta Gerwig. Yeah. And with Barbie. And that's such a phenomenal success. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, like, if you're paying attention, you would know that's going to be a big hit. But a lot of people were doubting it. Yeah. I think that's insane to have doubted, like, yeah. what a colossal hit that was going to be. And I think with that film, like you see the true ascendance of someone go through the ranks of like indie darling. Like yeah. I've been a ground zero Greta Gerwig fan. I was yeah. watching her mumblecore films as an actor when I was like in high school. Yeah. And then to see her go from that to then making bigger indies like Lady Bird and then a kind of mid-range studio film with Little Women, which I would say is one of the best films of mm -hmm. like the last 10 years yep. and one of the greatest like adaptations ever to then see her go on to make such a big studio picture that yeah. changed the game. Game. And I would say it was the reason why I think the two biggest movies of the year, you know, apart from Mario, uh, <laughs> are Oppenheimer and Barbie, and why they saw so much Oscar nomination love is they kind of show this change in what people are seeking out. Yeah. If you look at the last 10 years, the top films at the box office have always been like those Marvel superhero films, yeah. like stuff that takes the same shape every year. And I think what we saw the shift being this year with superhero films not doing so well, then these two rather unique films doing really, really well and overachieving all kind of expectations is what I think it is. You see the audiences want something that is – familiar to them something that they kind of know at least a little bit of what it's going to be like people know barbie people yeah. know like a big biographical world war ii type film yeah. but what they want is for those to feel fresh be different visually exciting to feel like there's a craft around them as well and i think that's kind of what it is that refreshed and yeah. what people what were so like, you know, the year in film was dominated by these two movies, yeah. the conversations. I think it was like that hunger was finally being served. Like, things that are familiar, but completely new and completely fresh. You know, I talk about those big hitters and the mm. top brass. These guys can just churn. I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon was an amazing story. It was way too long. We know that the, um, the rise of streaming has given these old perfectionists, like, free reign and a bit mm. too much reign to go as long as they want. Uh, Irishman was a good example of that. Look, it was a love letter to mafia films, which I don't think could really get made like they used to anymore. But um, Killers of the Flower Moon was an amazing story and it was a completely different terrain. It was just so fucking long and, and a bit indulgent. The actors were great, yada, yada, yada. It was interesting watching Leo play a dumbass. But I, I do think some of these old heads, Ridley Scott and Napoleon, Scorsese, uh, you know, with the Killers of the Flower Moon, they can just churn them out now. Mm. And it was very interesting to see Christopher Nolan kind of, despite being similar age to these old blokes 
and having had the same advantages in his career that you know that, that meant that someone like Greta couldn't exist 20 years ago mm. so to actually see him yeah see Nolan take his final form yeah i think that's i think that's a really interesting point because he's someone that kind of like evolves the craft like yeah. every film as well yeah, yeah, yeah. um and i do think that's an uh, it's interesting to say because he's probably mid career now really how so old who would he knows? be he's um I reckon he's got a lot more films in him. He is 1970, 53 years old. Okay. So kind of mid, yeah, mid-career. Right. So he's, he, he'd be one of the new additions to that. Yeah. you know, But to, he, he's someone as well that will put in that master of cinema category. Yeah. Like he has free reign. And especially after getting a, almost a billion dollars with this film. Yeah. Like what he'll be able to do next is something unheard a of. A billion dead slave masters. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, what, George uh, Washington, <laughs> <laughs> those Come Washingtons, on. dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me, actors, actors. Well, Killian Murphy won Best Actor. We've talked about that, like, that's was not really a surprise. There was maybe some thought, like, maybe Paul Giamatti could sneak in because yep. I felt that performance. I haven't like watched that yet. You would love that movie, yeah. I reckon. Like, Hold it's over. so warm, quite funny, yeah. and it has, like, this... It feels like it is captured from the 70s. Like, yeah. it just feels like an unearthed treasure that everybody forgot about. Yeah. Love that movie. He's Best, owed one, too, I think. Paul. I think so. Yeah. He's only been nominated for uh, Cinderella Man before this, yeah. supporting actor. <laughs> I reckon they'll give one to him next year if he does a good role, I reckon. I this this so. is a Christmas film, though, isn't it? Christmas film. They should have waited. Yeah. They should have waited. And I actually think Ridley well, Scott should have waited. in America around uh, Christmas time. Right, but then right. it, like, Australia came out just a little bit later because yeah, they yeah. wanted to get in the awards hype, which makes sense. But it's such a warm Christmas movie. We're yeah. just like, ugh. It'll, you'll watch it every year for the rest of your life, yeah. basically. Um, best Actress, that was quite a race. Very yeah. exciting. Uh, Emma Stone with Poor Things and Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. Two really incredible performances from two kind of different models and schools of acting. Like Lily Gladstone's smaller, somber, nuanced performance. And I think just spectacular masterclass of that kind of acting. Yep. And like so much of the stuff that you like, you could miss it if yeah. you're not paying attention or if you're not kind of understanding like what the craft of acting is, you could dismiss it. Yeah. But it's an undismissible performance for me. And Emma Stone, Poor Things, obviously I'm Greek. I've loved Yorgos Lanthimos forever. Yeah. And it was a film that I was not anticipating from him to basically yeah. him make – a Frankenstein, yeah. uh, freaking Edward Scissorhands. And I love Emma Stone, and it's such a big swing. Yeah. Like, that is a wild performance, yeah. as are all the performances in Poor Things. Those are probably my two favorite performances mm-hmm. of the year, regardless. Like, those were the two. So it could have gone either way. Emma Stone, second-time winner with this one. That's exciting for a young actor to get to at a young point in their career to see like what is even possible next. But Lily Gladstone, that's who I was going for. Like that is, you know, a new star, someone who can yeah. do so many interesting things. And it would have been like a historic win, the first Native American, Indigenous American person to win acting award, like a best actress award. That would have been, you know, what a great moment. What a great celebration. So it's a shame, but it's hard to argue because the performances were all so good. It was quite a stacked category. Mm. And then supporting actor, you got Robert Downey Jr., like a career award, basically, yeah. going for him playing uh, Strauss in Oppenheimer. And that's a fun performance. There's so many great moments with that character where you see his chops on display, which is something that we probably have missed yeah. for the last decade or so of his career. And tough category as well, Ryan Gosling and Barbie. That's like, come on, that's an all-time yeah. classic performance now. Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things, another huge swing. You could see that movie on the wrong day and go like, what is that performance? But it works in cohesion. And De Niro in Killers of the Flower Moon is just, you know, one of his best performances in the last 30 years of his career. And at Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, that's a really fun performance as well. Great performance. And then best supporting actress, Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. She was pretty much always going to win this. Yeah. Yeah, Great right. performance. She was nominated and won all the precursor awards. Mm-hmm. So not really a surprise, but a joyous experience to see someone get that big breakthrough yeah. moment like that and hopefully launches her to doing some really cool, interesting stuff yeah. and a bigger star. 
I mean, it's all happening, isn't it? This this new Indian blockbuster just come out. What's that one called? I believe it's called Monkey Man, and I think that comes out rather soon here in Australia and around the world. Um, Dev Patel, one of my favorite actors yeah. ever. If you're around our age, you saw Misfits on TV. Yeah. And I always loved that performance from him as Anwar and Misfits. To see him ascend to being one of the great leading men, yeah. it's like, how could you predict that shit? You can't. And it just yeah. feels so natural and, and, and such be, a great fair, career. He's playing, he's playing the lead in all of the mainstream, I would say mainstream in terms of broken out of India, mm. <clears throat> Indian films, mm. which is an incredible feat. Considering the diaspora all up, there would be two billion Indian mm. people in the world. And, you know, we've seen him in Slumdog Millionaire. Yep. And I look forward to seeing him in this. Yeah. And he also played uh, Nicole Kidman's son in... Yeah. Uh, in Lion. Lion. Which yeah. I think, another yeah. Best Picture nominee, great film. Did a great Aussie I, accent. Uh, great. I think he's such a superb actor. Saru Briley is the name yeah. of that character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I love that film. I love Dev Patel. I cannot wait to see this debut because it's like an action mm. film in that kind of John Wick, high yeah. octane, heavy stunt work Taking space. on Hindu nationalists. Yeah, and extremists. taking like the modern politics of India yeah. and like to, doing that. And I think that's the best way to communicate things in film is using genre and stuff to communicate like a deeper message because yeah. audiences understand genre films. So it's yeah. how you can kind of speak to them in a language that they really fluently understand. Yeah, which I think... I think Killers of the Flower Moon aimed to do and didn't really. I just don't know if the parallels in mm. American history were done because it was still kind of done like a gangster film. I mean... I, but I think that's it. Like, yeah. for me, then, this is something that they've spoken about. Instead of the film being a who done it, yeah. it is a who didn't do it. Yeah, like, yeah. everyone is involved. Yeah, that's an, that's, that's an interesting And I point. think, for me, it's like, I really liked Kills of Flower Moon, but, like, Scorsese is someone that I have connected with their work for most of my life. Yeah. Like, he's so core to my love of film. Yeah. So it's like, uh, it'll be very hard for me not to love a film by him. Yeah. But I found this to be really mature like and a lot of late period films can like from peri directors in like their twilight years if you yeah. will late period films like they can kind of lose a bit of that currency or that urgency yeah this one i think shows like how vital he still is yeah. in especially the sense of like reconstructing the story like how do we tell this story how do we retell yeah. history how do we do that and the ending of that film i think truly is maybe the greatest artistic statement of his career, yeah. of him as an artist, yeah. like the way that he's able to basically state his purpose of this film, yeah. his purpose as a filmmaker, as an artist. In the radio this funnies. In this, yeah, that, this ending yeah. that is so metatextual yeah. and interesting where he comes out and presents yeah. what has happened. Yeah. It's um, like, honestly, my hair stood on end because yeah. I think it's such a bold artistic statement and shows the vitality of his work and the necessity of his work. And I've, got to, I've got to watch it again. Mm. One recommendation I would make to those who haven't watched it is do not watch it in a heritage Victorian, like Melbourne cinema, mm. uh, on a wooden seat for three and a half hours. Yeah, that okay. was tough. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough. That's tough. <laughs> now... You've come here and you've brought a little bit of the last video store with you. Mm -hmm. I've asked you to come along with your pick of, you know, from reading the uh, Tudor Advocate. Yeah. Engaging, meeting us, meeting the editors. Yes. Meeting the writing guys. staff. I'm feeling, I'm putting my empathy out there. Yeah. I'm bringing in <laughs> stuff from who I know you are and finding it. And, and, and also, you know, uh, getting to know our audiences mm -hmm. uh, and, our, and our readers. What is the film you recommend them today? Well, I definitely want to find something Australian. Yep. Uh, that's something that I definitely want to recommend. Like that's a, a part of my mission is to help people fall in love with Australian films. And uh, there's this film that I think is like a truly underseen classic that once again was one of those films that was hard to find for a long time. Yeah. But now it's had this lovely restoration in the last few years. It is available like everywhere, Netflix, Broly for free, like on so many different ways to access this film. I think it's even on SBS On Demand. It's a film from a filmmaker called Shirley Barrett called Love Serenade. Have you right. seen Love Serenade, no. either of you? No. Well, 
I think it's right up your alley. 1996, right in that like patch of Australian cinema where we were making like the best indie films in the world. Yeah. Was that when the government had like a bit of a tax loophole where you know you could invest money into film development and get that as a tax write-off? Uh, not quite as strong as the Ausploitation era. Like that yeah. just peters out yep. where people could like invest and get 150% back. Mm. Like so not quite as <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> as that. So like films like Dirty Deeds and stuff that, you know, like they're entirely made because of tax well you know and people's artistic talents as well sure no no but those those ones (laughs) were the the night they called Uh it a day yeah those ones were predominantly um comedies that was predominantly comedies in that in that macquarie bank era this is just a little bit earlier than that so it's kind of like so these are the indies but who who, who, is like kind of like the castle okay head on two hands yeah. even like the this era of Australian cinema that was really vibrant yeah. and like r- like capturing some kind of zeitgeist and it's kind of stuff that you would see probably like e- that blending of tones of like comedy but with like a dramatic edge to it or something yeah. that you would see in like American Indies like Juno probably yeah. like 10 years later yeah. But Love Serenade is like this really nice, intimate film. It's set in like this small rural town out in Australia, like near the outback. Uh, and it stars Miranda Otto as a younger sister who lives with her older sister, played by Rebecca Firth. And they have like this small kind of life together. She's kind of stuck in this arrested development oh, yeah. state in her early 20s. I have seen this. You have seen yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And it's like got a great tone of comedy. Like it's mm. kind of. They work at a Chinese restaurant or something. She works at a Chinese yeah, restaurant. Yeah, yeah, She's got yeah. this little bit of this whimsy. And it's got, yeah. you know, when we say we're at a Chinese restaurant, it is a small outback town Australian Chinese restaurant yeah. that has like one customer a night. Yeah. And this new guy moves into the town. He is this hip Brisbane DJ who's been run out of Brisbane who comes to take over the radio station. This right. small radio station is basically the only thing that gets played on there. Yeah. And these two sisters basically start a love triangle obsession with this man. This spiv. This yeah, this kind of like old boomer Gen X y like, you know, music fan, plays a lot of like, you know, soul classics on the radio and stuff. And <laughs> um it's got this great sense of humor. Like it's got a bit of a surrealist touch to it well, a little bit of a magical realism. But um I just think it's like an unsung classic. Like yeah. truly unsung classic. Shirley Barrett only made three movies and this was her first film and I, I think it's like one of the great unsung okay. like, well, Australian classics you've out there. You triangulated us. Oh, there are, yeah. like, there were those those ones from that era. I mean, like, you've mm. obviously got Bad Boy Bubby. Yeah. And then you've got those ones that, um, was that one that Nicole Kidman was in with that bloke from fucking Almost Famous? Was in, um, uh, Noah, oh, Taylor. Noah Taylor. Noah Taylor, yeah. yeah. Uh, flirting. Those ones, Flirting, yeah. the sequel to the, uh, the Year My Voice Broke. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like that era, like even stuff like Priscilla, the eventual Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, like and there Malcolm. Was a, and, oh, yeah. I love Malcolm, Nadia Tass, The Big Steel, yeah. also in that era, another Nadia Tass film. Yeah. Um, but like really a fervent period of Australian cinema that I think right now we're kind of in a bit of like a wave is building in Australian film. Like if yeah. you look at you know, our equivalent of the Oscar Awards this year, the Actor Awards, there are five or six nominees for Best Picture and then there's also, like, Best Independent Film, which is a little odd because I think most Australian films are classified as independent films, but it's a way for them to show more love to more great films. I would say of those nominees, all of them were of such a high calibre, from Talk To Me, which won, to Limbo, the latest film from Ivan Sen, like it, it, Shader, another great film, Of An Age by Goran Stolevsky. Like it was such a vibrant year for Australian film. It leaves me with a lot of hope that Australian cinema is in the midst of something exciting. We're back, baby. Vibrantly happening here. We're back. And especially, you know, Talk To Me was like one of the biggest horror hits of the year. Like that transcended our yeah. borders like to the yeah. rest of the world. I'm, I'm very excited. You've gassed mm. me up here, Alexi. Thank you for triangulating our audience and giving My them pleasure. that love serenades. Mm. And um, for any of you who have uh, sunk your teeth into this cosmopolitan uh, young man's, uh, as I said, encyclopedic mind and, w- and want to dig in more, mm-hmm. uh, you can find him at The Last Video Store. 
Uh, you can find them on Instagram, last video store, Batuta, mm-hmm. uh, TikTok, wherever else. Yeah. But you can also find just the last video store, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Yeah. I would recommend watching YouTube because mm-hmm. it actually, there's a little bit of a visual kind of, um, there's a few assets there that, Oh yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, there's scenes that get replayed and there's- We've constructed know, the great video store of all time, basically. Yes, that. Yeah. It's, it, we're in the video store. We've had great guests like yourself, yeah. Angela White, the biggest adult film star in the world, stopped yeah. by and that was such a great conversation to like yeah. talk about the idea of performance in yeah. pornography, but then also like, you know, hear what her taste in film yeah. is like. Polly Bennett, the choreographer of Saltburn and Elvis, yeah. Uh, stopping by Luke Bracey, another guest of Batuta. Yeah, um, it's been really fun. It's like I think it's a really accessible way and fun way to like learn about films, get interested in films, yeah. and explore a little deeper and learn about you know other people's tastes as well. We, we, we're loving it. We're loving having you in town, and we love the smell of popcorn and the uh, oh, yeah. bright, bright fluoro lights. So. We've got those pre-packaged popcorns next to the killer pythons on the yeah. counter just <laughs> for you. So I'm just telling all the listeners, if you want more, tune in. Thank you for joining us, Alexi. My pleasure. Alexi Tuliopoulos, the Greek freak. <laughs>